I um, yeah, I was just saying before I hit record there, it was good to catch up with with you and Tess the other day up at our house. For for everyone listening, um, Mark's in Ararat, I'm in Point Lonsdale, which is not exactly close to each other. So when you guys are in town, any excuse to sit down and, and have a chat is fun. But we were, uh, Jesse and I were laughing Absolutely. because when you left, we realised that pretty much the girls now, I've sat just in the back room of our house. We have got me and you sat in the kitchen and just spoke running for <laughs> what must have been two hours. And then when it was time to go, we both looked at each other and was like, oh, okay, we that time's gone quick. So, I mean, when you get a bloke who nerds out on running talk as, uh, as much as you, I thought who better to, to have on the show. But anyway, what are, you, what are you guys up to today, man? You enjoying the long weekend? Oh, just uh, enjoying the sunny weather, actually. Um, yeah, it's not not a, a bad time of year. We really enjoy this time of year, along with every other person out there who likes vitamin D, I guess. So, yeah, no, uh, kids, um, <laughs> for holidays, um, yeah, just enjoying life, mate. Yeah, no, awesome. It's a bit like that. I actually, just before just before I came in here to record this, I'd pop down to our little local beach. I had a little, I've, I've done too much admin today on the computer. And it was one of those days where I was like, I've got to get out of the house, especially looking out at that sun. So I went and did a, a little gym session. And then after the gym session, I was like, oh, I've still got, I've still got 45 minutes. I'll go down to the beach for half an hour and, and just try and yeah, lock in some of that vitamin D and work on what is a, a very pasty body after a, <laughs> <laughs> after a pretty, pretty cloudy winter. So yeah, it's, it's nice when this sun comes out. It's, it's the only thing that stops me wanting to move up north when, uh, when those clouds evaporate. I go, okay. Maybe Victoria's where it's at for another 12 months. <laughs> yeah, it's a constant conversation, isn't it? Um, we've definitely got all four seasons, but it um, uh, puts you to the test a little bit. So, yeah, no, good, mate. Uh, it sounds like you've got some um, Irish and English origins in you like I do. The pasty white skin comes out pretty hardcore um, after a long winter. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's even with our kids. I don't know if you noticed, um, like Charlie, uh, my, my older boy, for everyone listening, He's kind of got Jesse's complexion, which is a little bit more Mediterranean, Macedonian, that dark olive skin. And my second boy has just copped 100% of my genes. He's just the whitest little fella in the world. So, I mean, we're going to have to do some serious sun work on, on little Ollie just to, to be in the ballpark of where Jesse and Charlie's at. But, yeah, with sun like this. But anyway, man, it was, um, it was really fun. Just so, so a, little bit, a little bit more uh, context on, on sort of what we were talking about the other day. You came around and... We, we'd been speaking a bit about Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who just ran 3.43 for the mile a couple of weeks ago, and that Yara Dengusi, um, who was half a step behind him. I think he ran like a, I don't know what the PB was, but you and I were nerding out on that. And one massive. thing that you said that was really interesting, it, w- it was unbelievable. And there's a, there's a few different avenues we can talk about. Because, I mean, even, even 10 years ago when I was running, apart from Al Garouge, I mean, you had like no one yen. Um, a couple of other blokes who were around about that 3.43 mark, but it was very few and far between. And yeah. up until up until this year, it kind of looked a little bit like an untouchable record, I thought, that 3.43. And then you see at pre, these two blokes go shoulder to shoulder, pretty much half a step behind that world record. And you go, what what's going on? I remember I confessed to you, I was like, look, I, I hate being the guy to say this. I hope everyone's clean. <laughs> but as I confess to you, the, the, Lance, the Lance Armstrong factor for me has, has tainted my trust in elite athletes because I had his back forever and ever and ever. And then when he came and confessed, I was like, oh, come on. You've got to get on my side and stick up for yourself, Lance. Oh, mate. It's, well, uh, likewise. The technology, the yeah. Strong bands. You remember the Live Strong bands, that, yeah, uh, the yellow bands that everyone wore? Yeah, got on board with the, you know, the, uh, the emotion of it all. Um, and. Yeah, probably in denial for quite a while once things started to surface there as of those uh, rumours. Um, but, yeah, like, gee, um, I still think with a lot of the psychology behind it, it's super interesting. Um, there's a new, I think I said to you the other day, there's a new documentary. Uh, gee, I'm going to say it's Netflix. I can't be sure. But um, basically the aftermath of Lance Armstrong's um, uh, fall from grace um, and what it's been like for the last decade, basically. And, um, yeah, that's also a really interesting look at the psychology behind it, what what drove an athlete. Um, you know, you've known plenty of athletes in your time um, and uh, there's, there's athletes who have just got the best balance, um, life perspectives, and you can see why 
they get the best out of themselves. But then there's other examples of athletes where they're driven um, better than anyone that they stand next to on the start line. Sometimes it is an unhealthy blend. And, um, yeah, uh, I guess it's just an interesting look at psychology, isn't it? Yeah, we were dancing around a couple of points. I kind of jumped straight into that. But essentially, I think what I was trying to explain was like with a performance like that, there's so many factors that have got to be considered. Like obviously, uh, let's just stick with Inga Brixen, one of the most incredible freak talents that you're ever going to see. Like even as a junior, he was breaking junior records, which is a good sign that, okay, clearly he's got the genes. Genetically, he's gifted. And then one of the other things that we spoke about was just how much the shoe technology has changed in the last few years. We were laughing about even 10 years ago when you and I were running or I was running a, a little more competitively, you'd have a pair of Nike flats that would, or, you know, the equivalent in spikes that would just leave you in a fair bit of damage control <laughs> for the days post-race. Yep. Um, so that's another factor. But then even even listening, and, and I'm very new to this, maybe you know more about it. I've been listening to a bloke called um, Olav, Olav Alexander Boo. I'm trying to get him on the podcast at some stage. He's cool. uh, the coach of uh, Gustav Eden uh, and another triathlete. I can't remember, one of the Norwegian triathletes from the top of my head. And he was just speaking about uh, the difference in some of the training styles that he's doing, particularly with those athletes. And, and one of the ones that I really hadn't heard much about was this idea of a double threshold. Now, I'm not sure if they're meaning like a double weekly threshold or I've, I've literally just the last couple of days started to, to dig into it a little bit more. So I, I can't speak too much on, on what it is. But just for three factors to kick start with, like they're three pretty big worlds of their own that, I mean, hundreds of podcasts have and could be dedicated towards speaking about but but the shoe technology was one that you sounded like you had a bit more knowledge on than me I, I don't know if you can speak to that but man do you remember what it was like running around in the shoes that we ran in even 10 years ago it's a different world uh mate yeah absolutely i've I, look a, a bit of a um disclaimer here i've always loved shoes um runners and shoes go hand in hand if you're not taking interest in what you're putting on your feet to perform um you're probably behind the eight ball um really against uh some of the people who are and and i think uh yeah as far as that interest goes it goes back to the days i remember in the early 90s you know the early pegasus from nikes and and um when the zoom technology first came out um as a advancement from the air max it's kind of sort of days i mean that was huge as far as a, a jump in in technology um goes and i just i love the responsiveness um from that zoom technology type um structured airbag basically in that forefoot particularly because i was a very toey type runner um in my competition days so uh <clears throat> yeah i loved all that stuff and then during my uni days i went and worked at the athlete's foot for several years um while I was there and uh yeah became a full on shoe geek basically <laughs> with it all so yes i have uh continued to show interest in this stuff and um yeah i think it's unbelievable actually it's um i, I read an article this week um uh sort of retrospective after the massive events of uh marathon run, running in over the weekend um at berlin marathon and um yeah there's a few of our top notch sort of guys uh making comment um about what their thoughts and feelings are based on the super shoe era um and yeah like i've heard uh described as many things super shoe i like um some some people talk, talk about them being pogo shoes um because they're just so bouncy it's like having a pogo stick that's just launching you across the ground so yeah i think the technology of this carbon plate and uh stack height of shoes now is um it's it's a next level um it's moved so quickly as well that um i think it's caught people a little bit unaware um of of potential uh risks as far as you know the ethics and uh, equity um with it i know uh watching the documentary there on um uh on netflix i think it was about alberto salazar and nike um uh bringing out those shoes how uh, when they were just coming out, the um, American marathon trials were uh, uh, about to take place and there were a lot of people complaining that all the Nike athletes who were sponsored 
would have a huge advantage because it's you know tested that i think it's four percent increase on marathon time or you know, decrease probably is a better way of explaining um on the marathon time um compared to a normal set of trainers um is was the you know uh, hypothesis behind it and and as far as all the testing that went into it they were able to sort of say that that very first shoe that came out i think was the four percent and so um yeah it was really interesting at the marathon trials everyone was saying this is unfair like our our shoe brands that we're professional athletes we've we, we we don't have the access to the shoes and uh and then they uh nike <laughs> as they do because you know obviously they were right behind any media is probably great media they thought great well let's give everyone in the field uh a f- a free access to a, a pair of the shoes so it was one of the most weird probably trials you would have seen i reckon in olympic history where um professional athletes being paid by companies uh to to be um uh their banner you know um athletes were putting on nike shoes <laughs> Uh, because of the uh, the Im- impress- <laughs> impressive improvement in their times, and no one wanted to miss out on those Olympics, of course. So they were forced into a real ethical kind of dilemma, um, where they had to choose um, to keep up or or stick with their their companies that had supported them. And uh, I, I I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in some of those conversations where, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a Brooks man right through and through, but Nike got these shoes. Can I wear them for these trials? Are you right with that? <laughs> And uh, what what the conversation would have been like? Yeah, so yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a huge, huge um, um, uh, era in technology advancements. But we were probably overdue, I reckon, in in the uh, certainly middle distance distance running era um, of getting some technological advancements. I'm I'm all for it as long as um, uh, some people are scrutinizing it and sort of keeping asking that question of the, what about this what about that and then just getting that balance right i think um between the upper end of where it, it could is a, go. it's a difficult it is a yeah sorry to interrupt you there no. i was just going to say it is a really difficult one to to monitor like it's a difficult one to know what the boundaries are do you remember it must have been in like 2007 or 8 i could have those dates wrong but in the world of swimming like every world record just started to get broken because they bought in those long swimsuits. Maybe it was maybe it was earlier. And I remember that conversation taking place like, all right, well, we this doesn't seem right. But then it's sort of hard to know what the the limit is because I think you were telling me that one of the the stack heights for the shoes was limited to was it forty mil? Now yeah. or there was like a particular race height that has currently been accepted. But really during the early conversations it just seems arbitrary doesn't it like 40s 40s okay but 45s a little bit rough um 100 you're probably not going to be able to stand up <laughs> like it's, it's hard to know where to where to draw the yeah yeah it, it's um but the, to go to your point about what they were saying with the um uh, with the athletes who had, had been represented by a certain brand and paid for a while i mean as an athlete you'd be dirty at the company that you're supposed to represent that they hadn't been you know uh, up to date with what was available and yeah understandably as a brand you'd be like okay well i want you to wear our shoes but <laughs> it kind of makes sense to me that athletes sort of gave the middle finger uh, to their to their own companies in in some regards because it's like well if you're racing against people who hurt simply because of the fact that they've got a sponsorship by a brand who is known for having sort of uh, you know breaking technology pretty much in in all fronts particularly in the world of running and you're stuck with the, you know, the your Nike Pegasus brand or the equivalent. And yeah. when you're lining up for an Olympic marathon trial, I would be, um, as much as I hate to admit it, like I would be the bloke running in a pair of Nikes as well if it was going to give me a bit of an advantage. But at the same time, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, a yeah, you're right. It would have been a, a very interesting time to to be a fly on the wall. It just would have been an angry athlete and angry brand ambassador <laughs> trying to trying to speed up the technology of their own brand. Not exactly the race preparation that you'd. Uh... Um, want psychologically, I reckon, prior to um, knowing that there's these shoes um, with perceived benefits, um, you know, and you're not wearing them and then having to raise that with your your sponsor. Yeah, Um, interesting times. But, uh, you know, getting through that phase, you know, of the people who are at the forefront with the Nikes leading the way um, and now seeing every other shoe company get on board with it, you know, um, this Berlin Marathon on the weekend where uh, the female 
winner ran um, two hours, 11 minutes, you know, uh, or just under two hours, 12 minutes for the marathon. Um, and she's wearing um, the latest um, Addy Zero um, uh, Adidas shoes that, uh, again, it's gone another step. Like these things are not cheap shoes, right? Um, anyone who's running at the moment knows that all of a sudden we've jumped up a hundred bucks at least as far as the budget goes um, for, your, for your normal shoes that you're sort of investing in. And and these shoes, I think, again, are another step up and you can't wear them much more than four or five times. I've sort of quickly read there about these shoes. But um, when you when you see the results of what this female athlete um, from Ethiopia did, um, on, on the weekend, again, it's just going to fuel that fire even more. It's everyone, it's incredible marketing, really, when you think about it. Um, you know, Nike were the first to do this and they did it so well that uh, I know in the, the major city marathons afterwards, like I ran in 2019, I had a run around the Melbourne Marathon. I just couldn't believe how many people in the just general population marathon um, were wearing these Nike um next percent or whatever they two percent four percent uh you know super shoes pogo shoes and um it was yeah it just seemed to like athletes foot years we were it was all about you know the right shoe for the type of foot you've got well all of that was just thrown out the window it would seem when you look down St Kilda Road running down there because there was all types of pronation issues going on people breaking ankles that looked like <laughs> in, like you couldn't believe and it just yeah, it showed the marketing was really doing a great job, um, but everyone, had, you know, it's one of those things, um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and, and um, yeah, the, the other advantages in performance, like, you know, um, supporting your foot in the way it should should have um, been supported, um, you know, to improve performance was forgotten about during that time. And so, yeah, uh, like, I mean, even Nike would explain that these shoes, and I think they're even written on a pair of the next percenters, they've... They're, they're um, designed for elite um, end performers. And we know that when we watch the African, East African runners, they run a little bit different than the average population person, you know, like some of the you know, general population may run similar, um, but these have been specifically made for the East African runner who typically runs uh, very much midfoot to forefoot striker. Um, virtually no heel is touching the ground with a lot of them. Um, I can't say that that's the whole population from East Africa, of course. It's all generalisations there a little bit, but these things have been designed for uh, runners who are, you know, moving fast across ground. Like, for example, you don't see a sprinter running on their heels, do you? You always see yeah. a sprinter off the forefoot. So the faster they're running, of course, these shoes need to be designed for someone who's a mid to foot, forefoot striker. So, you know, the East Africans are running fast. They're running incredibly fast. The women uh, are now running 211 for a marathon. So, you know, um, we are in a different category, I would say, um, but the marketing just shows that everyone wants to get on this train and just see what they do because I think um, talking to another guy, there's some studies out there that are starting to surface now about how they are great for some people but just terrible for others. And so what I was seeing down St Kilda Road um, is starting to get some evidence behind it where um, it may have a detriment to your performance rather than an improvement. So you still need to think about it. It's not just this uh, one-size-fits-all scenario. Gee, I wonder how Brett Robinson feels, or Brett Robertson. Like what a crazy feeling that is to recently break the Australian record and then all of a sudden you look around and just a few breaths away now is the uh, is the fastest woman in the world. Like it's going to be pretty humbling if it ever gets to a point where like the fastest woman has outdone the fastest men for the Australian record. I'm hoping these these new shoe updates correlate to faster performances for all of us because we've got to, we've got to keep ahead of these girls when it comes to uh, these marathon performances. It's going to be a bit embarrassing for Australia if the, the Kenyan girls start outdoing us <laughs> on the result sheet. Just to go back to your point you made earlier as well, um, to, to one-up your story about seeing all the, the next percents and things. I, I saw a bloke at my gym in a pair of vapor flies uh, a while ago. He's <laughs> just doing some squats and uh, he looked fantastic doing his squats, but I didn't say anything to him. But I remember thinking, just, mate, I, I feel as though you've misunderstood the concept. If you if you were told to go out there and do a 10K race right now, I think you'd be far more ready than what you realise. Oh, it's... Yeah. um. It is unbelievable. Like that marketing element is crazy. And I, I man, I'm, I got full 
does hook line and sinker get caught up in that like i this is like another conversation but I, I kind of have a little deal with myself that I'm not buying Nike anymore. Like Nike just do my head in. I'm so sick of all the woke ads. I'm so sick of like just the virtue signaling of big companies. It just does my head in. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to have my own little protest and just buy companies that are just normal and not trying to just tick all these, all these little virtue signal boxes. Anyway, the vapor flies come out, the next percents come out and I go, all right, you know what? Actually the ads aren't that bad. They're pretty good. I see what they're doing. <laughs> maybe maybe I can get myself a pair of these shoes and run fast. As soon as I saw Kip Chogo running around in them as well, like, yeah, first of all, he's his first crack at that sub two barrier. Then his second attempt where he's actually successful. It's kind of hard to argue with. And from like a, the marketing perspective, as you said, like if that's true, these new shoes, they're going to cost five or 600 bucks in Australia, probably. You can wear them five times. What a business model. Oh, love it. You know, um, I, I, uh, I've, I've run uh, for many, many years, but I've done some triathlon in, in the past. And, you know, um, I realized that uh, runners, you know, those real um, authentic runners out there who haven't have put that money forward for a pair of shoes, um, we've been conditioned into a, a very low budget type sport, you know, um, and, and, we, and we try to you know, fight for that low budget too, I think. And, you know, you look for the, the good deals around the shop. And, um, but triathlon, that was a completely different um, example of sport to me when I started doing that. It was like, you could have a bike, you could have a wetsuit, you got to have shoes, uh, training shoes, and then the racing shoes, and then and every other thing there as far as the training bike goes, and then the time trial bike, and, and the money, it was just like, you're doing this, you know, <laughs> um, just to be a part of the sport. So going, <laughs> going back to running after try and triathlon for a little time, um, it was a pleasure to come back to running because things were affordable again. And, and um, you know, family-wise, it was a friendly sport. But, um, yeah, now it's starting to push up into that triathlon realm there and, um, and get that flashiness about it. And, the, yeah, as far as that business model goes, what a great, great idea. Now that they've, they've broken the ice with, okay, we're going to jump up to a price point of, you know, 300 plus 400 if we really make a FOMO kind of feel to the shoe. Um, and then now, once we're at that stage, we're going to bring in this next one that doesn't last for any more than four or five runs. But, yeah, that concept, I think um, <laughs> back in the day of Carl Lewis, um, he was sponsored by Mizuno back in the day um, when he was, you know, uh, Olympic champion um, back in the uh, 88, 90, sort of 90s, early 90s sort of era there. And he had the one wear shoe, I remember. So it's a new, not a new concept, um, but uh, maybe it, it just didn't sort of take off back in Carl Lewis's days and they didn't get the kind of the environment right or, you know, but they do now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely, and not that I should be anyone to listen to on shoe technology. I mean, just I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm an armchair critic, but I just completely underestimated how much of an impact it it does make. Like I knew, obviously, to an extent, you're not going to run in gum boots and run your best time. But except, I thought ten years ago, like when you got a really light pair, of, except who? Cliffy Young. You remember the guy from Colac who was an oh, old yeah, yeah. Yeah. literally yeah. ran around in gum boots. Yeah, <laughs> apart from him. <laughs> that's right that's right sorry i'll uh i'll restate that you're not going to break any fast marathon records in a pair of gumboots you might be able to shuffle forever and ever and ever um <laughs> and get a reputation for yourself but um yeah you you put on a light pair of shoes and you go okay like surely this is this is the best it gets and i remember Motram, like it might have even been in the big mazungo that little documentary that they did on him yep. in around 2006 yep. was speaking about one of the um uh, I don't know what his title was, one of the Nike scientists or shoe scientists or whatever their title is, just doing some work saying, all right, like if we can even take half a second off each of your laps based on this shoe, mm. like that's, what's that, seven seconds, eight seconds over the course of 5K, that's the difference between like a place and a win. Yeah. And I, I remember watching that and thinking that's actually, like that sounds reasonable, like half a second over a lap, surely. And I guess if you apply that same theory to the course of a marathon, you start to see what it is that we're seeing at the moment. So. Yeah, man, it's it's been really interesting. I don't know, like for a marathon, obviously it's you, you've got your shoes, you've got things like um, gels, and a whole lot more focus on nutrition and fueling than than what we had sort of in the eighties and early nineties, which I think was just like a diet coke and a banana. Um, <laughs> but even yesterday, I was speaking to one of the athletes, one of the athletes that I coach, 
And like the only real experience I've had with the gels is is through one of the sponsors for this show, Precision Fuel and Hydration. And I mean, I like their stuff. I haven't sort of uh, ventured out and tried a whole heap. But I said to this bloke, Brock, yesterday, I was like, mate, like, what are you, because he's running the Melbourne Marathon and, and this week he's going to go out and run around 34K. And I just said, hey, use it as an opportunity. Like, have you been practicing your, your fueling and hydration and things? And he's like, yeah, yeah. I go, mate, what, um, just out of curiosity, what brand are you using? He's like, mate, I've tried a few of them. Um, the, my favorite one it, that just sits best with me is from like Coles or Woolworths. It's like, it's nothing fancy, yeah. but for me, it just gets the job done. I feel like it keeps me fueled. And it is funny, like the, the, the whole idea of how, how marketing works is, is a really interesting one because it's, I noticed this in the comedy. It, it's not necessarily the funniest comedian who also has, always has the biggest profile. Sometimes it's the bloke who's got like a little bit of a captive audience psychology behind them. So it might be a bit of a cult hero. Um, he's, he's known for something. Yep. And as a result, people buy into it. And the more people that buy into it, the more people buy into it. And all of a sudden, just you're all hypnotized by this wonderful idea. Yep. And when he said that, I thought, man, it's, it is very interesting. Because obviously, there's definitive evidence that something like a shoe, it, it actually works. I mean... That doesn't look like placebo. <laughs> but that looks as though there's actually something physical taking place there. Yeah. With the with the gels, like I often wonder, and again, I don't know a whole heap about it. I've spoken to Andy Blow from Precision a, a few times, and he'd be a better bloke to speak to. But I often wonder how much we buy into sort of the hype of of certain products and the effectiveness of it. Like, have you have you thought much about that? I don't know how much experience you had with gels when when you were training. Probably not something you need so much over five and ten k. But once you start to venture out to a marathon and sort of triathlon, it, it becomes a bit more of the uh, a key feature. Yeah. Yeah, look, um, I late in my competitive sort of running, like I, I look at my running performances as a pre-kids and post-kids kind of era. And so I've got a 17-year-old daughter now, so my competitive days were clearly 17 years ago. And um, just after she was born, I tried my first marathon and that was the first time that I really – entertain that idea of fueling and, and having a bit of a practice go at that. And again, like I said, we were pretty scrupulous with our, uh, our coin. And so when it came to, you know, um, using the top brands, I think, you know, uh, was it power bar were bringing out gels at that time. And, That's right. um, I went, I'd go to, you know, where could I get them from? Oh, you could go to some of these nutrition shops or rebel sport or something like that. So I'd go in there and saw the price of them. Like, <laughs> can't afford that each each long run I go and do so I'm going to go to Coles like like your uh, friend sort of said and um, I I got a brand there from Coles that I thought yeah this is good but the mistake I made was the whole time I trained with these types of gels which were easy to get down they were quite liquidy um, and uh, the gel um, side of things sounds like it's um, a fairly thick side of things whereas this one's were almost almost a almost cordial in a little satchel you know so um, but that's what I trained with, got all my practice done with that. And then when it got to the race, oh, well, we're at the big day now, we better get the, the good stuff, you know? And so I didn't do any practice with the, uh, the actual power, uh, sorry, the power bar stuff that I thought was better. And so I got out there in the first sort of 5k and tried to get this gel down at, you know, we're, I think we we're running, uh, first half we went through in 69 for the first half at the Canberra marathon. And, um, in the first 5k, um, yeah, it, Marty Dent actually was pa pacing us that day for the for the um the my first attempt and a number of other guys. I think um Magnus Mickelson was in there and um Anthony Haber was another runner going around at the time and um Gamechu Woecha from he was an Ethiopian turned Australian um out there. So we had a pretty competitive field. Um and uh yeah, I tried to throw this gel down and it was just like honey going down. So, and and when you're a little bit dry in the mouth sort of thing, it just got all claggy it was terrible so um that's probably where I first started but the triathlon was the thing that um I did a couple of half Ironman um events and that's where I you have to you just have to learn about it um because the duration of the event is just far too long for you to to do it without fueling throughout the actual event so you know um the competitive guys were somewhere around four hours ten in my age group sort of stuff that I was doing there so and the training rides, you only have to do it once to realise um, uh, how important it is, and that is completely hit the wall in training. Uh, I, I went out on a 90K time trial on the bike, 
and the power just went from my legs. It just, as soon as you hit that depletion time where you haven't refueled properly, um, you've got nothing, zero. It, it just, it's so humbling whenever you hit that wall. And so um, post that sort of triathlon era, I was, I was really personally interested in and being a, um, a year 12 PE teacher we started teaching a lot about it so i started learning a lot more about the ins and outs of it and yeah basically there's about 90 minutes of carbohydrate stored in your body um if you don't refuel you've got up to 90 minutes of basically a um, submaximal intensity that's you know obviously that half marathon kind of pace um or 10k to half marathon kind of pace but beyond that 90 minutes, there is absolutely no way you're going to be able to keep on going at that intensity if you haven't done anything about refueling. So um, this technology, I suppose, is adapted. Now there's brands that are even better. And I think what accompanied those super shoes at that time was sponsorship by uh, Morton, I think, with um, Alia Kipchoge. And so, you know, they started bringing out their product and, again, the measures that they had, they were rating it as um you know better than anything out on the on the market at that time and a lot of people got on board with that marketing as well and i know it's probably one of the preferred you know um nutritional sort of supplements for people when they're when they're competing in these endurance events now so um marketing mixed with science and then performance ultimately you know you can claim it but you got to back it up and um yeah yeah, yeah i think point. these days to we're seeing a lot of backing up of pretty incredible performances basically so Sorry, man, I lost you. I lost you on that last little part of the sentence. I, I you came back in at performances. Yeah, so I was just sort of saying that um, the you know backing up is really important after you get the marketing right, obviously, because they're claiming these performances, and um, if if they don't back them up, that falls flat, right? But we're seeing a lot of backing up of um, the claims now, and uh, I think that's the the thing that was through our conversation the other day. When it's not just limited to the um, marathon endurance events anymore. You know, we're seeing Ingebrigtsen just repeatedly running 330s and just below. I mean, every championship recently, it just seems they're under three minutes 30. It's incredible. Um, and so I'm interested in what, what this guy's up to, you know. Um, there's, there's obviously, we're going to be real about things as well. Um, we can only judge things off what we know. Um, but what we can see that is going well is, He's brought the sports science into everyday practice, um, you know, like just seeing, like mm. we talked about the other day, seeing that, you know, lactate testing is taking place after each rep of, you know, say um, a threshold type run um, or, you know, a, a tempo run or um, you know, just just seeing where, where that actual um, blood lactate level is um, so that you can gauge intensity as specifically as you can within training. So, yeah, watching... I recommend people have a look into some of the, um, you know, it's a little bit reality TV, obviously, but the Inger Britson's brought out early in the in the um, that family's sort of careers, a bit of a reality TV show. It's on on YouTube and you can check it out. But um, it's pretty interesting when you watch what's going on in the training. Um, you know, um, they they're just going to normal courses like everyone would find in their local area when they're runners. You know, they're not. Um, in laboratories, you know, doing these specific VO2 max type testing as such, but um, they are um, trying to bring that science lab into their everyday practice as well. So, and it's, you know, you hear about the one percenters, that's what matters when you get to a certain level, um, when everyone's very similar ability, everyone's doing the same things training wise, what things can you bring into your training that set you apart from the rest of the field? And I mean, training with Benita Willis um, uh, many years ago now, um, I think she there was no coincidence why she became the athlete she did. You know, for a few years she strung together not only all the big chunk of training but all those 1% things that would improve her performance, you know. Um, it was early on in the piece but there were these flotation tanks up at the AIS that were available to us when we were um, training up there on scholarship and none of the group were using it um but you know um bonita would sort of disappear during the days and i I walked um into the um medical i think it was the medical clinic at the ais one day and i don't know maybe it was a checkup i was there for or whatever and saw bonita on the way i said hey what are you up to bonita you know and she's like oh i just went in the flotation tanks i'm like what's that what do you mean and you know um basically they sort of theorized that one hour of sleep 
in this highly concentrated salt pool flotation tank they had available for the athletes for free, which, you know, if you're on scholarship side of things. So um, they said that would be worth about seven hours of sleep on the muscles of a night. And I'm just like, ding, like, this is gold. Like, of course. And, you know, so I, I was just being a bit of a student to seeing what people were um, doing and bringing into their training to just get those 1% gains. You know, you talk about um, the Mottram example there in the Mzungo um, where the, the, the sports physiologist or um, scientist basically was trying to improve things, you know, um, that half second scenario. Well, it's the same deal, isn't it? 1%, what's that look like in performance? Well, if you can gather enough of these one percenters, then surely there's going to be an improvement to performance down the track. And yeah, I just got really excited about all that kind of stuff. And I think Benita, as an example, she obviously was a student to it herself and she really wanted to get to the forefront because she was agonisingly close to being the best in the world at that point. She was the probably first to start breaking through into consistently, you know, top 10 performances at World Cross Countries. And then all of a sudden, once you put another 18 months, two years together of these one percenters, she's world champion. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting time mm. to see what's going on. Like, I mean, the depth in 1500 metre running is off the charts at the moment. Like, the, I, I don't know what the stats are, but it's, it's probably 20 plus guys who are running under 331 or something like that. Like, you know, go and have a look. I'd have to look it up. I haven't, uh, you know, got that in fingertips right now. But I know that that changed the whole um, way that these world championships that we just sort of saw um, run, like in and, and new rules coming into at those world champs where there wasn't, um, you know, how they used to have automatic qualifiers and then the next fastest qualifiers in the mix. They cut the next fastest out. So it was cutthroat. Mm-hmm. It was basically you're in the top six or you're out. So there was no backup plan and watch the next heat just in case you know so i was wow this is crazy and you know um we're seeing guys that would normally be kicking it down off a um you know 345 kind of pace and then you know everyone sort of comes in there maybe the 336s or 338s or something like that and that's normally in normal in the heats but it's just got quicker the whole field has got quicker now and um yeah of course the whole field now yeah, it's, it's record numbers basically um, under, you know, um, 330s whenever they do a Diamond League at the moment. So, you know, what was Stuart McSwain's recent run in that with Inga Britson? He ran 349. 349 at pre? Yeah, three, well, I thought, yeah 348, 349. Yeah. And like any other day, that's yeah. winning the race. That's just off the charts. And he was way back in the field. Was he? Like eleventh or something, seventh uh, or eleventh. I, I thought that something. Like, I, yeah, I reckon maybe closer to seventh. I, I remember that. Like three forty nine is an um. Like that weekend that Stewie had was unbelievable. Like yeah, you, you, you forget any other. If he had to run three forty nine in one uh, race at one part of the season and then backed up with the seven thirty one over three k, which he did the day after over three thousand meters, people go, "Oh, Stewie's back." But somehow, you're right, like in amongst the depth that there is now, it was kind of and, and also ran, as crazy as that sounds. The other thing that's happening is not, not only are athletes running faster en masse than I've ever seen before, young athletes are running faster than I've ever seen before. Stewie in that race was beaten by an 18-year-old kid from, uh, I think it was from either uh, Norway or Holland. Holland. It, was, it was one of those European countries. What's his name? Um, it was from Holland, I think. I know. Yes. I mean, in a yeah, where's the orange kit when they're running the world champs, don't they? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, he's eighteen. He's eighteen. Not even to mention our our boy Cam Myers. Like, who run? He's run three thirty three at sixteen or seventeen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and he was. Yeah, pacing, I'm not sure of the name of this bloke. He was pacing the mile. At, Paced the um, first eight hundred. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just looking up the results here. Yeah, Stuart McSwain tenth at um. At the pre oh, it was tenth. Wow! And you ran three forty nine thirty two. So you're you're right there. Um, three forty nine though. Like this is unbelievable. As you sort of said, we don't often see that. We we'd probably get excited low three fifties. Someone is in amazing form. But you know, you've got Ingebrigtsen, Nagus, uh, Nagusi, I should say, three forty three seven three, three forty three nine seven. Like, and that's close. It's just, again, like I was sort of saying there, sprint finish type stuff. Um, and they're running 343s. Mm. But, yeah, in saying that, though, like no and Yang was that person. It's probably these performances need that extra person pushing a Inga Britson the whole way, right? 
Um, it was the same with Noan Yang and Al Garouche back in the day. Um, Al Garouche never really had it his whole uh, own way. You know, like um, you look at his Olympic progression, there was a heartache type story with uh, Garouche that never got that gold medal. And it's because he was pushed so hard by the rest of the field. So we're probably based on that depth where we're really probably on the doorstep of records being reset. And it'd be super interesting to see if that Daniel Komen 3K gets touched. Like that's that 720, yeah, that, 1996, was it? 96, 97, uh, 720 that he ran for 3K. I wonder. They're yeah, three seconds from it, now, well, which I is a long way. That is a wild, wild record, isn't it? When you think about that, like the yeah. fact that no one's come within three seconds of it in what's it, twenty-seven years yeah. is uh, is pretty terrifying. Yeah, it's such a sweet spot for a bloke like Coman. Um, and Goosey, uh, yeah, I don't know how uh, I've completely lost confidence in my ability to say his name, but you know who I'm talking about the yeah. American three forty three ninety seven. Yeah, um, <laughs> and Goosey, yeah, oh. I uh, I watched him yeah. at the American trial. <laughs> I watched him at the American trials and he, he looks like an athlete who, you know, when you look at some athletes and they just, they just seem to do it easy. Like you watch him and despite the fact he's running 343, you go, dude, like you, you may as well to an untrained eye, you're just jogging. Like if no one knew mm. what it was they were watching right now, yep. it looks effortless. Actually at the American trials, it was interesting because they, they had some kind of heart rate thing going on the guys. I don't know if you saw that. And despite how effortless it looked like he was working with like a lap to go, his heart rate was sitting at like 193. Oh. Um, like he was, he was working, but you look at it on the surface and it's that duck's legs underwater just going for it. Yep. And I'm always interested in that because they're like, I, I don't care who you are, 196 or 190 beats per minute, you're working bloody hard. Yeah. It's interesting to see how some people seem to be able to tolerate that kind of discomfort. Um, like, and, and doing a little bit of technique work with some of the athletes that I'm, working with at the moment it's interesting when stress and when uh whether that's like physical fatigue stress or whether that's competitive stress because someone's right on your shoulder and there's 300 meters to go i'm fascinated at watching how people navigate that kind of tension some people you see that just scream straight out through their face their neck their shoulders their hands everything tenses up but then you have like an inga or uh, an angusi or like an alga rouge back in the day some yeah. people seem to have an ability to be able to funnel that tension in a way which actually allows their technique technique to remain like or even become more efficient like their arm swing gets a bit more extended yeah. um you don't see that tension through their shoulders i'm fascinated by that because if you've got a bloke running 190 beats per minute looking that smooth like there's lessons whether conscious or unconscious that you can tap into from that guy that i'd love to be able to have that conversation with because that's one thing that I, I was um, really encouraged about from a, from a young age was, sure, like you look at the best athletes in the world and there are exceptions to this, but pretty much like yeah, the fastest men over 100 and uh, to the marathon, same with the women, they also almost universally, universally look as though they're doing it the easiest as well. Yeah. And talking there's about, certain... There's certain uh, talking about the marketing side of things. Sorry, you go uh, on me. Yeah. No, that's all right. Uh, talking about the marketing side of things on that point that you're making, um, I think it's easy to watch those super relaxed athletes and not give them credit for how fast they are actually moving across the ground because the dilemma is they need to make it as, as uh, relaxed as possible to extend their performance. But in doing so, it almost discredits uh, the average, um, you know, viewer um, in, in what, what they can see is going on because they are, like you sort of say with Ngusi there, or Ngusi, um, he, he just looks like he's just fluent, just going out for a bit of a stride, you know, um, yet, yeah, clearly not the case. So it's this kind of um, paradigm where they're just balancing two um, scenarios out where they've got to look and feel and super relaxed um, at, the hardest they can possibly go. It's that's that's there's a real uh, again talking about psychology, that real psychophysical kind of link to it. Um, and I wonder where it starts is you know um, uh, with those those runners who are digging in so hard that it's all coming out in their face. I remember uh, Mori Plant. You remember the late Mori Plant um, as a commentator mm -hmm. for um, a lot of the Melbourne meets and you know uh, international um, athletics athletics agent. Um, he, uh, 
he was one of the best commentators and there was a guy, um, I think it was Sammy Legat, and the guy had a set of t- chompers on him. He had some big teeth basically. And when he was coming into the home <laughs> straight, he would be just gritting his teeth and they'd be just like, you, you see these big teeth basically just, and he's, and it's tense. It's not this relaxed kind of paradigm we're talking about. It was just, you knew exactly how hard this guy's putting into it. And um, I remember Murray Plant saying, and in comes Sammy Lickat. I think it was Sammy Lickat. I hope it was. Uh, but bearing his molars to the breeze. <laughs> so, like, literally, <laughs> the wind rushing past his face. But, you know, that's it. It's so just an athlete. You know, you got one person here who everyone knows how hard this guy's going. In fact, we're a bit worried he's going to trip over or hurt someone who's trying to run past him because it's like an octopus in a washing machine sort of thing, you know, arms and legs going everywhere compared to those smooth <laughs> movers like uh, Ingebrigtsen who are just, uh, he's so, so good, I, like un, under 3.30 and it just looks like he's out for a little bit of a, a stride at the end of his session, yeah. Uh, I, I want another one percenter, which I think is often, over, or maybe not overlooked, but it's not talked about as much as I reckon it should be, is the younger brother syndrome or the younger sibling syndrome. Oh, yeah. To be a, the youngest of three boys in that family is unbelievable. Just to have, because you know when you're a young kid, like my example was I, I dreamed of playing AFL first, like that was my first love. But as a young guy, like my dad, he had a little bit of a run around on the Footscray list as a, a young guy. And and I remember growing up with him and thinking, well, if he had a look in, like what's so special about that? Like he had a look in with a club. And that's like a, a very micro uh, sort of sneak behind the curtains of, of what must take place in a mind of a, a bloke like Inga Brixton. Like you're looking at your two older brothers who are both Olympians, the best in their country, and you're training with them every single day, not only uh, you know learning about the training and actually probably being forced a little beyond where most 14 or 13, 14, 15 year old kids are. But just being able to tap into the psychology of that, like going, okay, well, these are my two older brothers. They're very talented. They're saying I'm talented. I'm doing the work with them. All of a sudden, those outlandish kind of goals start to look very reasonable. And I, I think there's another great example. And for listeners overseas here in Australia this weekend, we've got the the AFL, like arguably our most popular sport here in Australia taken place in Melbourne and in one of the teams at Collingwood Football Club, the, the Dacos boys, you've got Josh Dacos, who is, I don't know his age, but then you've got his younger brother, Nick Dacos, who's, you know, lucky not to win the best in the league or unlucky not to win the best in the whole league this year. Uh, but the younger brother often credits the fact that, okay, his older brother's five years older than him and he used to rub shoulders with his brother who was playing in VFL list, trying to get a, a game in the AFL list. And all of a sudden, just that that huge big leap that it seems to be from like an aspiring 14-year-old kid, I, I just feel as though that's narrowed a, a whole lot. So I'm really fascinated yeah. with, with that dynamic in families as well. Like how much of an impact does having someone who's good at what they do help a, a younger kid? Even on a more local scale, I used to run with Dean Huffer and Craig Huffer. There was about a five-year gap there. And Dean Huffer was maybe a 345, 1500-meter runner. Yep. And Craig Huffer, Craig Huffer used to run around with him and he, he had like a level of confidence, which I really admired, especially looking back now that we weren't competitive yep. because, or now that we're not competitive because I would look at that and I'd go, oh, it's unbelievable how much you back yourself. But then you'd go to his house and Dean would say, yeah, I'm good, but Craig's more talented. And his dad, Dennis, would be like, yeah, you're more talented, like blah, blah, blah. And you go, how can you be anything but backing yourself in an environment like this? Yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely tapping into Something I think absolutely is real in in building a culture of success, um, and when you can take that snippet of a you know fairly insular kind of example like a family setting, that real very pure um, com, you know family competitiveness where the little brother just wants to beat the big brother because the big brother was always better, so they've just got this constant day to day kind of yearning to to um you know drive their their whatever the focus or value is in that kind of um competitive sort of field and you know uh you know you talk football side of things um in in running it's it's absolutely there and i think it's transferable basically across many different kind of areas where you want performance if you can breed that culture that it's just always at the forefront of people's mind. Like, I mean, you goal setting 101 um you know Kathy Freeman she 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 uh 
uh, had a devastation of um, not making uh, the medal podium in 1995, I believe, at the World Champs. And for a year, on the way home um, from those World Champs in Gothenburg, she um, wrote down, I think it was on the sick bag in the plane, in the in the pouch in front of her where she was sitting in a seat, wrote down, she wrote the number 48.6. Um, down on the sick bag and then she transferred that onto a sticky note and she put it on a mirror at home and every day she was like combing her hair you know brushing the teeth whatever she would be reminded of that goal it was right there up in the top corner each day it's just that that forefront of mind stuff and you know uh 12 months down the track 1996 olympics you know what what time did she run in the final to almost beat marie jose perec 48.63 still the australian record for 400 so you know like these kind of um things that are your reminder systems, you know, your brother can't get much more of a reminder system when they're rubbing your face in it, obviously, of like, oh, look what I just did, you know, Ingebrigtsen, <laughs> as a younger brother, he was told for years, no, you're not allowed to do the training. You're not allowed to do the training. You're too young. You're too young. You'll have to sit on the sidelines because you watch some of those early, um, uh, the Ingebrigtsen's reality TV show and it shows it, the, the, the culture that was in the family of what was valued, you know, and what 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 we all strive for. And but we're not going to let you do it just yet. It's just like candy, uh, you know, kid in the candy store stuff. We, we'll show you what it's like, but you're not allowed to do it just yet. Uh, I, I just reckon it's yeah, absolutely spot on there. And if you can get that kind of drive, um, where uh, you've got someone who's responsible overseeing it, but you can just keep that um, that that group of people trying to perform, chafing at the bit, sort of thing, um, where they're just ready to go for a long period of time, then that's that's where champions are born for sure. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, that whole dynamic's interesting. I haven't seen that Inga Brixton um, documentary series. I've seen little snippets of it. I might have to check it out. Um, yeah, it sounds like a it sounds like a good one. There's not much like that in the world of distance runners as well. There's not much of an insight into the training and lifestyles. I mean, people like Matt Fox with Sweat Elite, the YouTube channel, and um, there's a couple of YouTube channels which are quite similar to that. Gives you like a, a really good taste test now. Like, the, thank God for YouTube. It, it really opened your eyes to, you know, just some of the um, training practices and diets and mindsets and things that are out there. But yeah, yeah growing up, I remember it would, it would have been such a treat. It was all like I had a couple of Brendan Foster books and maybe uh, you tap into a said Co documentary if someone from Glen Huntley Athletics Track would just give me the VHS to take home. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, there wasn't much really that you could just uh, jump online and, and have a look at. So, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting time. As you say, it's an exciting time for, for not just Australian distance running, but, but we, to be honest, like track and field in general. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just been wild to see, to see what people are capable of. So, mm. man, the, the next 12 months I'm excited for seeing Stewie uh, back at his best is great. Young yep. Cam Myers. It's it's the first time where I'm at that age bracket now. I know. Well, I think I'm about eight years younger than you, so you might have seen it a little, maybe once before me. But where you see like a fresh young batch of athletes come yeah. through, and you go, "Oh my gosh!" Like, all right, it's a. Uh, I've I've been pushed into a different category now. Like the the fresh batch are here and, and ready to roll, and yeah. I uh, I both love it and hate it. I hate it from the perspective that like, okay, my time's done at this level but i love it from the perspective of like all right this is uh this is really exciting to watch as an as an athletics fan i guess yeah absolutely um it is it when you're in the sport or at least you're interested in the sport long enough like you and i have been um you, you do really appreciate those um ebbs and flows of a of, of performance and and so yeah look going back to what we talked about in the start some people uh, are critics of all the new technology um, that's surfacing in, in running shoe technology for, for athletes. But I think it's more than that. I think it's we've got all the worlds are aligning, since, so to speak. We've got a lot of sports science that people are um, tuned into and using as every, everyday practice now. Um, we've got a lot of psychology, as we've been talking about today, um, where people are really on top of that side of things. Um, there's a lot more developmental support now um, where many athletes are lost. Um, when they're in that sort of transitional youth kind of era um, to other sports, potentially they've got that support down pack. So we're starting to see that, um, you know, like with Mottram's, um, uh, you know, on running group that he's got going now, um, he's trying to target that sort of development. Um, you know, Melbourne Track Club's done that for since back in 1996. They've sort of been trying to develop people through. Um, and, you know, the scholarships that were about um, 
also try to do that. But I think we're starting to see the balance get get right and um, we're keeping people in the sport most importantly and, you know, that utilisation of the college scholarship opportunity seems to be one that's um, it's been an important step for getting people through that kind of um, no man's land um, where we do lose the athletes because um, there's just not enough support out there. So, and then that's probably where some of that culture is built too of value um, during those years where we can see that psychology of people hanging into a sport because there's no greater place really than America to get a bit of atmosphere at high school, college kind of level um, for sporting championships, you know. So anyone who's tasted that in the athletics realm, they've come back a different athlete. Like I remember Mike Power coming back in the uh, 2000 mm. sort of era after running with Arkansas. He, he was always a very good athlete, but he was for sure, like every one of us, at risk of being lost to the sport during those years. Instead, he went to Arkansas and he just raced and he trained hard and he came back and he just – he was setting a standard for us all. So, um, yeah, and then that's like that little brother thing because I, I actually, when I was running, I looked like a mini version of Mike Power actually. He was probably a lot bigger, a lot taller, but I could have been past <laughs> his little brother. And so that sort of pushed me along a little bit too, to, you know, just that, hey, he can do it. Maybe I, I could too maybe. So, um, yeah, but no, it's, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a very cool time to be a witness to um, athletics and I love the excitement that we're starting to see come out of it. Marketing. The whole works, you know, there'll be people who debate the ethics behind things for sure. But overall, I think athletics, athletics is going to benefit. Um, and just on a side note, I, was, I wish we had caught up, uh, but I went up to the World Cross Country at Bathurst. Um, and uh, that was, that that certainly needs some unpacking. Um, what a great championships that was. Uh, oh, oh, dude, well, hey, it's an open invitation. Maybe we do that. I'd like, I'd love to do it with you, man. But I told you at the start of this podcast, I have a hard cutoff if I want my wife to stay married to me. Um, I'm taking the kids at four. It's 3.57 and they're over at the park. So I'm going to have to hang up and run. Yeah. But dude, um, hey, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's always always fun chatting with you. Yeah, no worries, Toss. Very good, mate.